with that. So let's uh, continue from where we stop in Second Corinthians chapter six. So in that uh, second verse, Paul references Isaiah forty-nine. Would someone um, be willing to read that for us? So maybe we can read. Um, it is a long chapter. We'll just read from verses one to verse eight. Or verse 9, the beginning of verse 9, maybe more complete. So Isaiah 49, it says 1, 2, 9, the beginning of verse 9. Isaiah chapter 49, verses 1 to verse 9, right? Listen, O coastline, to me, and take heed, you peoples from afar. The Lord has called me from the womb, from the matrix of my mother. He had made mention of my name, and he has made my mouth like a sharp sword in the shadow of his hand. He has hidden me and made me a polished staff, and in his quiver he has hidden me and he said to me you are my servant O israel in whom i will be glorified then i said i have labored in pain i have spent my strength for nothing and in vain yet surely my just reward is with the lord and my work with my god and now the lord says who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, so that Israel is gathered to him. For I shall be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. Indeed, he says, it is too small a thing that you should be my servant, to be raised up, to raise up the tribe, the tribes of Jacob, and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation to the end of the earth. That says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel, their Holy One, to whom, to him whom man de despises, to, to him whom the nation abhors to the servant of rulers. Kings shall see and rise, princes, shall, princes also shall worship because of the Lord who is faithful, the Lord holy of the Holy One of Israel, and he has chosen you, that says the Lord. In an acceptance, in an acceptable time, I have had you, and in the day of salvation, I have helped you. I will preserve you and give you as a covenant to the people to restore the earth, to cause them to inherit the desolate heritages that you may say to the prisoners, go forth to those who are in darkness, show yourself. They shall feed along the roads and their pastures shall be on all desolate heights. Amen. Thank you. Um, so why do you think Paul goes back to this passage here in verse or in chapter six? Why does he quote from Isaiah 49? Whenever we see a quotation from another 
part of scripture, it's good to go back to that passage and read what was the context uh, within which it was written, right? Uh, so we read here in Isaiah 49, it is the promise of the coming Messiah uh, who will restore Israel from a place of judgment uh, to a, a place of exile, they will be restored to their land, they will be brought back, they will once again experience the prosperity, the blessings of God that uh, had been taken away, uh, that they had lost because of their sin. Um, so that is uh, a promise that the Jews were holding on to and uh, waiting on. Uh, right to see that restoration happen um, and now uh, Christ had come in fulfillment of that so when Paul uh, in previous chapter has talked about all of this uh, reconciliation that is ours he's now also uh, telling them that this Christ is the fulfillment of that uh, hope of Israel Right, the hope of Israel that has been there for hundreds of years, uh, been longing for this restoration that was promised to us. Christ is that promised Messiah. Uh, and he uh, has come to give us, this is the day of favor, this is the day of salvation. That day that uh, Israel had been waiting for for hundreds of years is now there. Right, and is now being given to them, is now being presented to them. Uh, and so he's saying, don't, don't ignore this great grace that is here before you, that is being given to you. Uh, receive it, be reconciled to God, come back to God. Um, and uh, and he says, I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. That is, it has been fulfilled. Uh, these promises that were given uh, have now been fulfilled and now is available to us. So receive that. Uh, he's, uh, he's encouraging the Corinthians to receive it. So verse 3, we put no stumbling block in anyone's path so that our ministry will not be discredited. Um, in the NKJV, it uses the word offense. Uh, we give no offense in anything that our ministry may not be blamed. Uh, so the word offense here uh, refers to uh, causing someone to fall or causing someone to stumble. Uh, and so he says, in carrying out our ministry, we don't want to cause somebody else to fall. So the way we carry out our ministry, uh, whether in the words we use, in the way we live our lives, in uh, the actions, uh, what we do, uh, in all of that, uh, there should be no cause for someone else to fall. Uh, so he's saying this is the way we carry out our ministry. So that's something for us as well uh, to think about. Uh, we carry this great gospel. We carry this great message of reconciliation. Um, but how are we presenting that to others in the way we are doing our ministry? Uh, is our ministry itself reflecting the gravity, the uh, power, the grace, that is in the gospel. Uh, and if it is, then that itself should, uh, should be a testimony to the people. But if there are things within the ministry, if there are issues uh, that are unresolved, that are remaining uh, undealt with, then that will be a reason for people to fall away. And so we shouldn't be giving people any reason by the way we are doing our ministries, to discredit the work that we are doing or to discredit the gospel itself, uh, right? Um, then we go on from there, verses 4 to 13. Could someone read that for us, please? But in all things we com but in all things we commend ourselves as as ministers of God in much patience 
in tribulation, in needs, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonment, in tamlots, in labors, in sleepless nights, in fastings, by purity, by knowledge, by long sufferings, by kindness, by the Holy Spirit, by sincere love, by the word of God, by the power, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the hammer of righteousness, on the right hand and on the left hand, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as chastened and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing yet possessing all things. O oh, Corinthians, we have spoken openly to you. Our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted by your own affection. Now in return for the same, I speak as to children, you also be open. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. What? Fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness, and what communion has light with darkness. Amen. Okay. Jeffina uh, posted uh, what the word now in chapter six verse two is. So, uh, so Paul is saying that day of salvation, that time of God's favor, that was prophesied about in the Old Testament is here and now, meaning Christ has fulfilled that and it's available to you uh, at present. So, um, and, and he's saying now also in terms of, I'm offering that to you now, uh, like I'm calling you back to be reconciled to God. So uh, you have the opportunity now to be saved, to experience that favor of God. Um, So um, in that, uh, just to go back to that Isaiah 49, uh, verse 8, in the time of my favor, I will answer you. In the day of salvation, I will help you. So it was looking forward to this time of favor, to that day of salvation. So Christ's coming, and since then, till now, uh, till Christ's return, is this time of favor, this day of salvation. Uh, so it's not a specific day or a specific moment. But it is this opportunity uh, that is being offered to people to be saved, to come into the favor of God. Uh, and uh, so it's an extended period of time. So, uh, yeah, verse 3 we covered and verse 4. Uh, so he's saying, uh, in verse 3 he says, we are not doing anything that will cause you to fall away from the faith or to discredit the work that we are doing. But on the other hand, what we are doing is in the way we are conducting ourselves, that itself uh, tells you uh, that you can trust us. Uh, our works itself, the way we are doing things, uh, and then we we'll go on to elaborate what all he's talking about, that commends us to you. Uh, that is our recommendation or that is our um, that is evidence uh, or that is our good report that will stand that stands before you and then all of the things he lists here as examples are things of uh, sacrifice suffering endurance it's not uh, it's not the things that uh, people would boast in it generally, right? It's not about uh, his knowledge, not about his speech, uh, his eloquence as a preacher, uh, not about uh, using wisdom, worldly wisdom. All of those things are not the things uh, that are commending them. It's um, their sacrifices for the gospel, their perseverance in, uh, in spite of the in spite of the suffering, right? So the the reality of suffering is definitely there, 
but it's not that they are giving up in the face of suffering. Instead, they're continuing to faithfully serve. They're continuing uh, to take the gospel to places. They're continuing to pursue this church uh, itself that has rejected, uh, that in so many ways is rejecting uh, him. Uh, and so all of that things is, it's endurance in spite of all of these things. We are continuing to do this work uh, in spite of all of the challenges that we faced. Um, so just, uh, yeah, the first uh, verse 4, verse 5 is talking about all of the sacrifices, the persecution, the suffering. Uh, then verse 6 talks about more of uh, their own heart and their own uh, their own spirit in this. So in purity, understanding, patience, kindness, in Holy Spirit, and in sincere love. So talking about their own motivations uh, and attitudes in serving. Uh, and then in truthful speech, in the power of God. Uh, so their words have been uh, words of truth, right? So there were other people who were coming in who were saying certain things, but the truthfulness of what they were saying was questionable. Uh, but uh, with Paul, he's saying you you can trust what we are saying. Uh, that in our words is also the power of God that is being displayed. Uh, weapons of righteousness. So, however they were doing their work was in a way that displayed the righteousness of God in both their right hand and the left. So in both ways, in the way they were defending themselves, in the way they were. Uh, they were carrying out their work and everything, the righteousness of God was displayed. Um, and then in aid, it, it says, even if all of these challenges are coming up within the church, uh, we have continued to serve you. So glory and dishonor, bad report, good report, genuine yet regarded as imposters, known yet regarded as unknown, dying and yet we live on. So these challenges have come up uh, here in this ministry, uh, but we have continued to uh, serve whether y'all have dishonored us, whether there have been bad reports about us, uh, whether uh, we've been regarded as imposters, whether people are questioning whether they truly know us, in you know, all of those things we've continued to serve. Um, sorrowful yet always rejoicing, poor yet making many rich having nothing and yet possessing everything. Um, uh, and yeah, so just to see that contrast of uh, that last verse, verse 10, uh, to say that even in the suffering, we have rejoiced. Even in our poverty, we have continued the work of enriching people spiritually. Uh, and even though we've had nothing, yet we know that everything is available to us there's nothing that we lack um, and then verses 11 to 13 we have spoken freely to you and opened wide our hearts to you we are not withholding our affection from you but you are withholding yours from us uh, and so here is where he goes back to that uh, what he was talking about in chapter 5 being reconciled uh, so he's calling them to be reconciled uh, to him so uh, to defend himself that whatever we've said we've said uh, openly we've said honestly we've spoken freely um, and we have um, loved you fully we've opened wide our hearts to you that is we've allowed you all to come in fully we've not withheld our love from you uh, but on the other hand you have not uh, you have not loved us with that same kind of acceptance. You have not uh, trusted us. Uh, you have withheld your love from us. And so he's saying, um, he's asking them to open their hearts. So verse 13, uh, open wide your hearts to us also, because that would be the uh, fair thing. When we have come to you in this way, uh, and speaking to you as my children, uh, as, as someone who loves you all, as someone who can be trusted, uh, you also come to us with that same level of trust and love uh, that we have shown towards you. As uh, so we go on from there, uh, verses 14 to 18. 
someone read that for us, please. Verses 14 to 18, chapter 6. Second Corinthians, chapter 6, verse 14 to 18. Do not be unequally together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial, or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. So uh, Paul here uh, kind of switches focus uh, to uh, to something else, and then he will go back to what he's talking about before. Uh, so that is uh, quite common in this time when, when in the way they wrote letters is when in between they would talk about another topic, then they go back to what they were saying, and so uh, he does that here and. He goes into uh, being yoked with unbelievers. Um, uh, so the context for this uh, is not clear why he's bringing this up uh, at this point. Um, but it's interesting that he brings it up at the same time that he's, on the other hand, calling them to be reconciled to God. Right? So if you're not reconciled to God, if you're not, uh, you're not coming into this oneness with Christ, then who are you coming to oneness with? Uh, is it that you are yoking yourself with uh, with people who are on the other side who are not in Christ? You're yoking yourself with unbelievers. Uh, so uh, in verse 14, so he, um, he talks about uh, this idea of being yoked. Uh, so that is like um, this picture of two animals having, uh, like how we see um, being used in farms or being used to plow the ground, right? They have a wooden piece that is put over two animals and they walk with that uh, together uh, to plow the land. And so if it's, if that yoke is being used uh, or that wooden piece is being used with two different animals, then they can't actually do that work effectively. They can't uh, actually carry out uh, that work of plowing. Um, so this is in reference to Deuteronomy 22.10, and there are various other verses in the Old Testament, but this specifically is from Deuteronomy 22.10. Uh, if someone could just read that for us, please. You shall not plow with an ox, a clean animal, and a donkey, an unclean animal together. Yeah. So can we see where that a specific example of your king is used uh, between two animals. So that is kind of the image of uh, being yoked with somebody who is not your equal, uh, who does not match uh, your uh, where you are. Uh, so some ways in which we can understand this, what is he referring to when he's talking about uh, being yoked together? Um, we can understand it from the perspective of 
uh, marriage uh, where you do come together and uh, you are becoming, you're carrying on that purpose uh, that God has for each of you. You bring your purposes together and you carry that out together. You live out your purpose together. Uh, so if uh, you are getting married to an unbeliever, then you will not be able to fulfill your purpose um, and you will not be able to carry out what God has entrusted to you because the unbeliever won't have that same uh, vision, that same perspective that you have of serving God. And so that is one way in which we can look at what does it mean to be unequally yoked, how we can take that into um, where we can apply it in our lives. Uh, another aspect is uh, in a business, if you have a partnership with someone and you're carrying out a business, um, that is a place where really you're working so closely with someone else. You have to have the same uh, values, the same uh, vision, the same way of carrying out your day-to-day -day work. Uh, so it's a very big thing to handle money, to handle decision making, to handle uh, relationships with other uh, businesses. All of those things uh, will be affected by the person's faith. Uh, and so if you are getting into a business partnership with somebody who does not have the same faith as you, um, then doing that work will be very difficult, will be very challenging. So that's another way to look at uh, how uh, how do you avoid being yoked with an unbeliever? And then a third way is uh, in the way we let the world influence us, or uh, how do we allow the world? Uh, what place are we allowing the world in our lives? So, if we are allowing it to influence the way we think, uh, if we are if we are conforming ourselves to the way the world does things. Uh, then we cannot, uh, we cannot also stay in in step with God, because we are yoking ourselves to the world, and so we will start to come under uh, the influence of the world in the way we are doing things, rather than uh, taking on the yoke of Christ and being led by Him and following through on His purposes, His vision for us. Uh, so those are three ways we can apply that practically. Do not be unequally yoked uh, to an unbeliever. Um, so uh, Paul goes on from here to look at certain differences between uh, a believer and an unbeliever, uh, and he uh, he brings out a few things. Uh, so the first is fellowship. So uh, fellowship between righteousness versus lawlessness. So uh, righteousness is what we talked about, right? That you are walking in this perfect unity with God, with his purposes, with his plans, uh, with his desires, with his will. Um, versus lawlessness is in direct opposition to that. It's uh, walking uh, by your own standards, your own will, whatever pleases you, not desiring to submit, uh, not desiring to uh, do what what is said to be right or what is said to be wrong, uh, not following those rules. Uh, so it's saying these two cannot uh, cannot share with one another, cannot be participants with one another. If you are in the perfect will of God, then you can't at the same time be opposing the will of God or walking in your own ways, doing what you what pleases you. Uh, so that is one uh, one contrast, one difference between the believer and the unbeliever. Uh, the other is uh, that there cannot be intimacy or communion between light and darkness. So uh, light representing um, purity representing truth, uh, representing uh, a spiritual understanding, right? Uh, uh, our spiritual eyes being opened. Uh, 
so when you are spiritual eyes are open when you're walking in truth when you're walking in purity then at the same time you cannot have uh, intimacy with somebody who is blind right somebody whose eyes have not been opened to the truth who uh, doesn't know the difference between right and wrong uh, who is walking in in that kind of darkness uh, in immorality uh, so because they don't have that that same uh, revelation of truth versus or what is true versus what is false or what is right versus what is wrong they walk in sin uh, in their ignorance maybe uh, or in their willing rejection of truth uh, whatever it may be there can be no intimacy between this between light and darkness uh, then light is the absence of darkness darkness is the absence of light so those two cannot be together uh, another is you can't walk in there can't be agreement between christ and belial so uh belial was a, a jewish term that was used to refer to satan um and it means worthlessness so he do word that means worthlessness so christ uh this anointed messiah son of god uh between satan there can be no agreement between those between Christ and Satan. Uh, the fourth one is there can be no share or no portion or part between a believer and an unbeliever. Uh, so we know obviously a believer uh, is somebody who has put their trust in Christ, who has surrendered their life to Christ, is following Christ. Uh, an unbeliever is someone who does not have that relationship with Christ. Um, so does, does not uh, have that faith or that uh, desire to follow, to be obedient to Christ. Um, and then the last difference he talks about is there can be no agreement between the temple of God versus idols. Now here, the temple of God, he's referring to the body of believers not referring to an individual but the body of believers in in this passage um, and so uh, the body of believers in which the presence of god is uh very spirit of god dwells cannot uh walk in agreement with uh an idol that is from the demonic realm Right? So it's a false god, a god that uh, represents uh, represents evil, that represents uh, uh, this darkness, uh, that represents uh, the demonic realm, and so that cannot be uh, in agreement with the spirit of God. Uh, so these are just some uh standards that he's setting for the church that if you are looking at walking with an unbeliever you are basically walking in complete contradiction to anything uh that is even possible spiritually because of all of these differences that exist uh between the uh holy spirit and between um uh, walking in this in this area of being led by Satan, uh, being um, under the authority of anything that is demonic. So there can, can't be anything between these two realms. Um, so he asks all, the, all of these questions. These are rhetorical questions, right? So he's saying, can this happen? Can this happen? Or uh, what fellowship can there be? Uh, what does a believer have to do? What agreement is there? All of those things say there is no agreement. There is no. So the answer to all of those questions is there is none. There is no uh, compatibility between all of these things. Uh, and then he says, uh, he goes on from there um, to verse. Okay, so verse 16, again, he quotes from the Old Testament. Uh, so verse 16, I will live with them and walk among them and I will be their God and they will be my people. Uh, 
that is from a few verses, a few different chapters in the Old Testament. Maybe we can just read um, Leviticus 26. If someone can read that first. Just from verses uh, 1 to 13, Leviticus 26. Leviticus chapter 26 verses 1 to 13. You shall not make idols for yourself, nor shall you erect an image, a sacred pillar, or an obelisk, nor shall you place any fingered stone in your land, so that you may bow down to it. For I am the Lord your God. You shall keep my Sabbaths and have reverence for my sanctuary. I am the Lord. If you walk in my status and keep my commandments and do them, then I'll give you rain in its season and the land will yield her produce and the tree of the field bear their fruit. And your threshing season will last until grape gathering and the grape gathering will last until planting. And you will eat your bread and be filled and live securely in your land. I will also grant peace in the land, so that you may lie down and there will be no one to make you afraid. I will also eliminate harmful animals from the land, and no sword will pass through your land. And you will chase your enemies, and they will fall before you by the sword. Five of you will chase a hundred, and hundred of you will put ten thousand to flight. Your enemies will fall before you by the sword. For I will turn toward you with favor and regard and make you fruitful and multiply you, and I will establish and confirm my covenant with you. You will eat the old supply of produce and clear out the old for the new. I will make my dwelling among you, and my soul will not reject nor separate itself from you. I will walk among you and be your God, and you shall be my people. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt so that you would not be their slaves, and I broke the bar of your yoke and make you walk upright. Uh, so we see, so we see here a, a lot of things that Paul talked about, right? So, uh, what have idols to do with the temple of God? Uh, and then in this last verse, do not be yoked. Uh, that same language of yoke. Uh, here in verse 13 of Leviticus 26, it's being yoked under the Egyptians uh, versus being yoked under Satan would be the spiritual equivalent of uh, what Christ has done for us. He has freed us from the yoke of Satan. And so, um, so we see here in Leviticus 26 where God is calling them to honor him Right, to worship him alone as God uh, and uh, to revere his sanctuary. So verse 2, it says, observe my sab uh, Sabbaths and revere my sanctuary. So why was his uh, sanctuary to be uh, given that kind of respect and honor was because his presence, the presence of the Lord was it. And so uh, Paul is saying that same thing. So uh, honor honor the presence of God in your midst as a body of believers. Uh, you honor uh, what God has entrusted to you, uh, which is his very presence. And in doing this, there will be a blessing upon you. You will have victory over your enemies. You will experience God's favor. Um, but the greatest thing will be that God himself will be present among you and he will be walking with you. Um, and so uh, this is what he's uh, saying in verse 16. What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? Uh, for we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them, walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. Um, and then verse 17, he says, 
uh, therefore come out from them and be separate, says the Lord, touch no unclean thing and I will receive you. So uh, this again is a reference from the Old Testament. Um, so let me just see, we can read one of those passages. So the two uh, verses that are uh, given here is Isaiah 52, 11 and Ezekiel 20, 34 and 41. Uh, maybe we can just read Isaiah 52 from verse 7 uh, to verse 11. Isaiah 52. Pastor, come again. Isaiah 52. Yes, Isaiah 52, verses 7 to 11. Okay. <clears throat> How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who, who proclaims peace, who brings glad tidings of good things, who proclaims salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns, your watch watchmen shall lift up their voices, with their voices they shall sing together, for they shall see eye to eye when the Lord brings back Zion. Break forth with joy, sing together, you west places of Jerusalem, for the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all nations, and all the end of the earth shall see the salvation of our Lord God. Depart, depart, go out from there, touch no unclean things, go out from the midst of her, be clean, you who bear the vessels of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you. And if someone can uh, read as, uh, Ezekiel 20, uh, verses 32 onwards um, till 41. Ezekiel chapter 20. This is 32 to 41. What you have to do shall never be when you when you say we will be like the Gentiles, like the families in other countries, serving wood and stone. As I live, says the Lord God, surely with a mighty hand, with the Lord, I will rule over you. I will bring you out from the people and gather you out of the countries where you are scattered with a mighty hand, with an outstretched arm, and with furry poured out. And I will bring you into the wilderness of the people, and there will there I will plead my case with you face to face, just as I pleaded my case with your father in the wilderness land of Egypt. So I'll plead my case with you, says the Lord God. Until I will make you pass under the rod and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant from among you and those who trans transgress against me. I will bring them out of the country where they dwell, but they shall not enter the land of Israel. Then you will know that I am the Lord. As for you, O oh, God, God, go serve every one of you. 
his idols, and hereafter, if you will not obey me. But profane my holy name, no more give gifts and their idols. For on my holy mountain, on the mountain height of Israel, says the Lord God, there all the house of Israel, all of them in the land, land shall serve me. There I will accept them, and there I will require of your sacrifices together with all your you as a sweet aroma when I bring you out from the peoples and gather you out of the countries where you have been scattered and I will be hollow in you before the Gentiles. So uh, we see here um, yeah so we uh, see in both these passages that are quoted from Isaiah 52 and Ezekiel 20. Isaiah 52 is this promise of restoration of Jerusalem uh, and bringing out of Jerusalem from under uh, bondage to uh, nations that have uh, taken control of it or have come to reign over it. Um, and then in Ezekiel 20 is also again uh, this uh, uh, promise that the people will be brought out from uh, their place of judgment and a new covenant will be established with them. But the difference we see between Isaiah 52 and Ezekiel 20 is that Ezekiel 20 also talks about judgment of those who have turned away to worship idols. So even though everyone will be brought out of uh, out of their exile, out of their bondage, uh, not everyone is going to reach that promised land. On the way to the promised land is where God will execute judgment on those who, uh, who turned away from him, who worship idols. And so in this verse, uh, 2 Corinthians 6, 17, um, he's calling them to separate themselves. So he's saying, separate yourselves from these idols, separate yourselves from these unbelievers. Uh, because if, if we are looking at Old Testament uh, history, those who didn't separate themselves will be the people who come under God's judgment. So y'all have received this gospel, y'all have uh, been invited to freedom in Christ. But if you do not walk in obedience to Christ, do not walk in oneness with Christ in uh, the Holy Spirit, then you will not uh, have the privilege of being in God's presence in eternity. Uh, you may have come to this place of uh, believing in Christ at one point, but now if you are choosing to yoke yourself with, uh, with idols, with darkness, uh, with unbelievers, then you are going to experience judgment. Um, and so he says, uh, come out, separate yourselves from them. And then verse 18, um, and I will be a father to you. You will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Again, a reference from the Old Testament, uh, which I think, I don't think we have time to look at, but that's from 2 Samuel 7, verse 14, uh, <clears throat> where this, uh, promise is given to the people of Israel that you will uh, be restored to me, you will come to this position of being sons and daughters. So we see here in this chapter, verse 5, Paul talks about being reconciled, being brought into a right standing with God, being uh, made the righteousness of God, uh, right? And then he uh, calls them to recognize what a huge blessing this is and how they should respond to that blessing, to that grace that they have received. Uh, and one of these ways in which they uh, they need to recognize uh, that they are being drawn away is being yoked to unbelievers uh, or in some way joining with uh, darkness. So he's saying separate yourself from that darkness come uh, back to Christ, because in that place of coming back to Christ is where you will uh, experience your true identity as children of God. Um, so we'll continue from there next week. Um, have a good week, and God bless you. Thank you.